Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 322 for Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napoma, California, returned from Cabo San Lucas, celebrating my 59th birthday. Nice. It's Paul Kent. Welcome yeah. back, man. Yeah, that's, oh, that's great. That's great. Cl- clicked another one over. Uh, hey, you know, success. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> better, better than the altar. Better that than the altar. That's what I keep saying. That's right. Yep. The age increasing is better than it staying the same, man. Yep. Uh, and our sponsor for this episode is uh, is Ultimate Ears, where coupon code GIGGAB20 gets you 20% off. We'll talk about the details of all that in a little bit, but I uh, just wanted to let you know. I also wanted to let everybody know that uh, we do not have Bob Heil with us this week. As you may have heard at the intro to the show, we are recording and hopefully releasing this on Tuesday, the 19th. We were supposed to do it yesterday, the 18th. Apple then scheduled their event for the 18th. And so my my other day job required me to reschedule things and Bob wasn't able to join us today. But we're uh, he's eager to come on the show and hopefully we'll have him next week. So we'll uh, we'll keep you posted on that. So, hey. yeah, yeah, we um. I just came out of a a long weekend. It wasn't a long weekend, but it was a long weekend. (laughs) We, uh, Bitter Pill is getting ready to record our next record, which will be the band's third record. Uh, And we're doing that in December. We are, we've decided to go into the studio. We earned a bunch of money this summer playing all those gigs that we played and uh, squirreled away a bunch of it. And so we are happy to go and spend that in this and, and actually be able to record, you know, with an engineer, which, which we've done all, all the previous times too, but there was some talk about doing it here and, and we decided it'd be better to have somebody else do that job. So Dave can just bang drum and not have to worry about also being an engineer and everything else. Um, but we spent this weekend learning a bunch of songs that we didn't know. Uh, Billy and Emily have both written a ton of, ton of new songs and we wanted to run through those, learn them, and figure out which of them should go on the next record. And then which of the say seven or eight songs that we've been playing all summer that have yet to be recorded should, should also go on this record and figure all that out. So we did, we started on Friday night. We rehearsed pretty much all day and into the evening on Saturday. And then a good chunk of the day on Sunday, we probably wound up playing for, I don't know, probably 10 to 12 hours. We hung out for more than that. But, you know, playing why and hanging out is equally important time, uh, especially for this kind of a thing. So we were probably together for, you know, 14, 15 hours and played for 10 to 12 of that. And it was it was fascinating. We have never with this band had a long rehearsal. Uh, you know, we've always carved out time to get together for, you know, two hours, three hours, maybe on a you know Saturday afternoon or whatever. And. We've never really been super productive with those rehearsals. We'll, we'll sort of half play a song. We'll figure it out like, okay, got it. And we know each other fairly well, obviously. And so we can go and play these things. But this weekend, we really were giving each song the time it deserved. And we, we figured out how to rehearse together. Like we could, we could do this again in the future and we would not need multiple days. We could, if we realized if we scheduled a full day, maybe, you know, planning to play for four or five hours, which means getting there, you know, an hour before then to get set up and really get going. So carving out five or six hours would, and maybe even seven so that we can have like a food break in the middle or something. Uh, We really got to a point where we were super efficient and like we were moving very quickly, but did not hit. I don't think we rushed anything. Like we gave like I said before, each song, the time it deserved. And a few of them won't make it to this record. Like we, we learned them. We got all the way through. We were like, yep, we're good. And then when we broke for food, it was like, yeah, I don't know that that one is in a spot where we should be recording it. I was like, yep. Okay, fine. And it, you know, we would sort of talk about it and, and, uh, and move on. But it was really an interesting thing. Every band needs to learn how to rehearse efficiently. And it, it, it does not necessarily come on the day of the first rehearsal 
it, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that you got to kind of figure out and, and this weekend bitter pill figured it out. I mean, we, you know, we've been successful. We've been playing crowds are growing. Things are doing great. But in terms of rehearsing, we really, it was exciting to get to that point and, and realize, Oh, okay. We figured it out. Great. This is cool. And it's different. Well, yeah, it is different. And you know, this is a, um, extract this out to like the biggest picture. This, sure. this, there's a, there's a karma that happens when creative people meld, right? So mm-hmm. let's, let's just blow this up, right? Sure. The yeah, Beatles, of course. The Beatles, right? Individually, good musicians together. Whoa. <laughs> but you would never have known that if they, you know, if they didn't get together, would they be the same magic if they were in different bands, even though they're good musicians and talented people, you can argue that all day long, but sure. you, what you can't argue is that the sum of the parts, right. Is, is, is greater than, than any of the individuals. Right. And so this happens creatively. And I, I found this with the house rockers recently, you know, as we've been working this new bass player in once it clicked, it became something way bigger. Yeah. You know, it, you know, there, there's a magic that, that permeates that is, you know, when someone has a subtle anticipation of where someone else is going with something and there, you know, that is like one to many, like when the bass player knows where everybody in the band is going, yeah, that's playing live. That, and there are two, I, I think we're talking about two very distinct things, both of which are, are necessary and good, maybe not necessary, but certainly good for a band. And and you're talking about that, that thing where you click and play together and lock in live. And, and that's important, but that's not what we learned this weekend. What we learned this weekend was how to rehearse together and how to be very well, focused I- at that. I totally get it. And so, so, you know, there's, there's this concept of discipline and, and a yeah. shared discipline and everybody's, um, everybody's unique perspective about what discipline is when, when you find the sweet spot that everybody is aligned with and therefore you're getting everybody's buy-in and everybody's, you know, best attention and best effort. That, that, that's really, I think they're related things though. I oh think no, they, they're absolutely related. Yeah. And I don't know that, you know, we played whatever it was, 20 gigs, 19 gigs or something this summer. I, I don't know that this rehearsal, even if we had given it the same amount of time or perhaps even double the time this weekend, I, like, I don't know that it would have been as productive if it didn't come on the heels of playing those 19 gigs or whatever it was. Yeah. Be- because, yeah, we had we had developed that and that really got cemented this summer. And then it was, OK, now let's get together and rehearse how to how to do that with the next crop of songs and and learn those songs and really get into them. But, yeah, we all and maybe that's part of what made it efficient without seeming rushed is we already knew a lot of the answers because we've been doing it all summer and we know how this band fits together and how things work. And it's like, okay, well let's try this. Let's try that. There's no point in trying this. Cause you know, that's not how this band fits. So we'll try these other things. Although we did try some stuff that might not have fit and it started to work, which is great. You know, um, to, and that was one of the nice things is giving ourselves that time. Nobody was rushed. You know, we, especially Saturday, we all, you know, we had carved out Friday night, Saturday and, and even into Saturday night and then, uh, you know, all of Sunday. And so to, to be there at, you know, two in the afternoon on Saturday, three in the afternoon, taking a break, nobody was in a rush to leave. I was like, okay, we'll take a break and then we're going to get back at it. And everybody was fine with that. Nobody had anywhere to go. And, um, and it worked out really well. And we, I mean, there's some tunes that really came together nicely. I hope we remember them. (laughs) Uh, well, we re- we did. We recorded, you know, the, the at least one take of each tune, just rough here, so that we've got it captured. Because it whose is idea a- was it that that's that's the, what you should do. You should go wide and just brain dump ideas, as opposed to oh, here's a good one. Let's spend our time in this. How did you come to that that group decision? So it it uh, the I mean, it was Billy's plan, but but I don't think there was no there was no either or. I I think that's what I'm trying to get at is we were able to do both. We went as deep as we needed to with each song. And I couldn't even sit back and tell you how much time we spent on any given tune. We spent all the time it required and then we would record it. And we were, we were in no rush. I mean, we got through uh, maybe 12 songs this weekend, somewhere between 10 and 12. I don't know my notes in front of me and it was a long weekend which is why we recorded things, but, and took notes, but, um, there were 30 songs on the list. 
Like it, it, there, there was no way we were going to get to everything that, that, you know, Billy and Emily have collectively written, uh, you know, bef- up until this point. So it was, we were just giving each song the time it needed. And, and then we would just go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And then it was like, yeah, I think we're done. Okay. We're done. Great. Sounds good. You know, off we go. <laughs> We've got enough for the record. Yeah. yeah. So it, we, we, it, we were able to go wide and deep with, with this, which was wonderful. Um, you know, it helped, you know, we want to put 10 to 12 songs on the record. And so we came into this weekend with seven that we've been playing all summer. Now it turns out that some of those that we've been playing all summer are not on at least the working version of the track list to go in and record that may change between now and December, but probably not. And so, you know, but but we added, we probably have five of those and then five to seven new ones that we, that we did this weekend. That'll, that'll make the cut and, and we'll go and record them. But it was, yeah, it's, it's, it was great. But yeah, it was, it was Billy's idea to do the retreat. I mean, and you know, we all agreed, including him once we got to the end of it, like, okay, we don't need to do, you know, two and a half days again. The next time we do this, now we have figured out how to do it. And we figured out that three hours is, is not enough. I mean, if that's all we have, we can get together and do it, but much better to just carve out an entire Saturday. And this is band rehearsal day. And we'll just, you know, dive in, do it. And then we're done, which is cool. It's been That's cool. Yeah, it really, yeah. It really is. Yeah. So this, this, uh, discussion has me reflecting on like the whole concept of, um, focus and, and, um, discipline, right? So, <laughs> well, if, if, if we were reflecting fully on focus and discipline, we'd follow the agenda and talk about the sponsor next, which is what I'd love to do. And then maybe talk that, more about, sp- about, I focus like, I like what you did there, by the way. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, our sponsor is ultimate ears pro. They have been changing how the industry makes music since 1995. Like these people there and the brand have been at the beginning of the whole in-ear monitor journey and they know what they're doing and they've figured out lots of different things over the years. They've, they've made some experiments and some of them have stuck, some of them hadn't. And it's fantastic. They, uh, they have their new UE switch, the interchangeable face plates that now they have that you can put on your in-ear monitor. So like, They've always done custom monitors and you could always get them customized to look the way you wanted in addition to being customized to fit your ears. Well, now you can change that customization on the fly with these face plates with a variety of colors, materials, and even like decorative patterns and details. Very cool stuff. And it's just got this twist lock thing that, that it just works. It's amazing. I want to get a pair of these because I minor, you know, the, the old style that uh, just the, the one face plate. So I, I, I want to dig into this because this is cool. <laughs> and it's so I no, but they, like, this is what they do. They keep moving forward. They know they're musicians too, right? We had Brian Geller on the show. He, you know, he's a big part of what Ultimate Ears is today. And he's also out there, you know, pretending he's David Lee Roth. Uh, you know, on the weekends and doing this using their stuff, they know how to get it so that you can hit the stage with that ultra clear sound and superior isolation gig after gig night after night. And as I said, they have a deal for us because their stuff. Usually you, you pay for what you get. It's worth it, right? Well, now you can get more than you pay for because if you go to pro.ultimateears.com and use our code, Gig Gab 20, G I G G A B 20, you get 20% off UE Pro ear monitors. Uh, so you get to go check this out, right? Like it's everything from. Good deal. The, yeah, yeah. The, everything from the UE7 Pro up, uh, this Gig Gab 20 code is applicable for. So you can save 20%. The UE7 Pro, the 11 Pro, the reference, the 18 Plus, the live. I mean, you got to go check this out. And you can do it at pro.ultimateers.com, code Gig Gab 20. The offer is good through the end of October, so get on it because, you know, we're here. Take advantage. Get moving. And our thanks to Ultimate Ears for sponsoring the episode. Great brand. Yeah, man. Yeah. All, All right. right. So focus and, and uh, discipline. So I, I, I'm reflecting on this in two ways. So okay. one is, as I've been sharing, my band is about to want to refresh our, our song list. So the first thing that we're doing is we're going back through our list of songs that we've had in the past and uh, everybody's going to speak up and say which ones that we need to do. Sure. Uh, 
And I would say this about, about managing discipline in a band. There's a couple things. You have to, there's not one way to do it because all bands are different and all band personalities are different and all, you know, it, it, there's just so many variables. You either have to be a good leader who knows how to harness consensus to get people focused and disciplined. Or you, if you're, you know, in a more democratic, you know, you need to encourage it from others. Sure. You know, everybody likes the idea of, of changing their song list and their set list and, you know, be having fresh stuff that keeps the band entertained and, you know, something fun, new to bring out to your, to your audiences. But, you know, it's also often a, a road that has a lot of pitfalls because again, there's so many different opinions. So I, I think that, um, you have to know what the chemistry of your band is. Yep. You have to decide whether, you know, you're going to say, here's, here's, as a leader, here's the plan, follow me, let's go. Or, you know, like I've said before, I feel that there's songs that I want to do, but I can sense that the, you know, there's not buy-in from the band over uh, getting a lot of lumps and bruises over time. What I want is, is music that everybody in the band feels good about long sure. run, even though I may not get everything I want. Um, you know, it, it's very much more satisfying and enjoyable to play when the whole band is on the same page. So I think that's the goal. I will tell you for my own solo stuff, I am so freaking ADD about this stuff. I am right now, if you were to ask me for like the solo acoustic stuff I do, mm -hmm. I'm in various states of ready with about 50 new songs. You know, some of them are like, oh, I want to have a polished show next year and I, you know, I'm going to do six songs on a looper and I'm going to do three songs on, a, on toll string. And, you know, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of structure it in a, in a much more rigid way. So I get kind of like 20, 30, 40, 50% into, into those types of songs. And then some shiny object over here is like, <laughs> Oh, people would love to hear this. So, you know, I have like, Oh, I really need more new material. Right. That, that, that you know, and so, so at any you, one time, when you go do an acoustic gig, do you have a set list, like a hard and fast set list that you are going to play or are you playing completely off the cuff or is it somewhere in the middle? When I go to a show and people come to see me, like the coffee house show that I do where everyone's facing me and I am entertaining an audience. Yes. I have a, I, I may have a set list, but I definitely have a plan, right? Sure. So th that's what I'm thinking about, like these things. When I do stuff where it's like a restaurant and I'm just background music, you know, I'll just play whatever I want to play. And, and okay, uh, so there's know. no set list for for those types of gigs. So it depends on the gig. You might have a set list, or you might not, and it's it's intentional based on you know various uh, factors of of the yeah. vibe of the gig. Got it. And okay. I, I, I am always looking out for more of those shows where it can be about me and I can do those things. And that's sure. you know, where I spend a lot more, a lot more of my, um, uh, personal rehearsal time is like in those situations, how do I make it a, a different experience for people? So, like I said, I've, I think I've shared this in the, in the, in the past is like, you know, just strumming cowboy chords for three hours, not to me a terribly interesting show. So I kind of, abstractly view it as, you know, there should be a certain number of finger picking songs. There should be a certain number of altered tuning songs, Interesting. you know, 12 string songs, you know, I, it should sonically sound different to people. So it's not just, you know, folk songs are on the campfire for three hours. So, yeah. so now, and, do, you, that, do you look at the key of songs and, and try and make things flow so that you're not playing songs all in the same key so that you're kind of moving things around and keeping that part of it interesting too? I, I'm not so much about the keys. I mean, okay. you know, you end up you end up on guitar. You know, I play in in two or three capo positions. So I guess yes, you know, there is some variance. Not everything's in the key E or in the key of D. Or, you know, like that. But and I am aware that I want different sounds through the course of an evening. Sure. And so you know, I will look for, and also you know arrangements of songs that lend themselves well. I like to do some classic rock songs that get people's attention. You know, yeah. if I, if I, if I afford myself a detour to play some songs that I think will sound good or have like some really cool lyrical messages to it, I realize that, you know, I'm not an original artist who can bank on three hours of people's attention that way. So, you know, I somewhat consciously say, okay, I've, you know, I've kind of taken my left turn and done some stuff I want to, you know, share with you. 
but then I kind of bring it back to people's people's attention by doing stuff that might be more familiar. And, you know, in general, you know, I find Beatles material is almost universally the best tool for doing that. Right. (laughs) You go out, you go out into the outfield for a while. And then if you want to get people, you know, back to something familiar, there's so many Beatles songs that are great to do. It's interesting. You know, we were talking, I forget who I was having having this conversation with about bands who play the Beatles and there aren't that many bands who play the Beatles, but you're right. Solo acoustic, the Beatles wind up getting thrown in more frequently than they, than I see them with cover bands, right? It's, you know, and when we were doing Beatles songs in fling, that was one of the things that people would be sort of shocked about is we'd have, you know, six or eight Beatles tunes in the, in the song list that we could pull from. People are like, oh yeah, nobody plays the Beatles. There's, like, there's yeah. a Beatles stuff for every mood. There's, you know, there's yeah. Beatles stuff has been reinterpreted in so many millions of ways over time. Yeah. And you know, so many great messages in the lyrics. I mean, they, you know, Beatles stuff is, you know, it, I would say Beatles stuff is essentially the Shakespeare of our time, right? It is, it is, you know, music that will last forever, messages that will last forever. Yeah. Um, it is, it's eternal. Yeah, I agree. I, I totally agree. But it's not, I've seen, it's tough to do it as a band, like if you are a Beatles fan, you know, the, um, the, the, the phrase do no harm comes to mind, right? You, you, <laughs> it, well, I mean, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do it exactly the way the Beatles did it, but if you are going to interpret it, and even if you think you're doing it the way the Beatles did it, you're still interpreting it, right? Cause you're, you know, you, you're, never you're, gonna sound like you're playing it, not them. You're singing yeah. it, not them. Right. And so y- you have to, you know, any song that you do that with, you have to sort of put through the microscope of, okay, does this, you know, does it work? Is it, so let's pause on this for a, a second. Good thing? So yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's cause I know you're a huge Beatles fan yeah. and you're knowledgeable. Beatles. So I'll tell you Beatles songs that we've done in the house rockers. So we've done day tripper, which is a great garage band song. Yeah. You know, grip and rip it. And you know, that, that no problem. We've done, it's, it's not um, easy though. Most bands play it wrong. They do the build up the wrong way. They don't, they, they do it way too long, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. And then now thinking back, I'm pretty sure we did it to code, but you know, we'll see. We did the, um, baby, you can drive my car medley from the love show. Though. The, Matt, so the was, Giles Martin mashup of, of love, the word and, uh, exactly. and, and I think I guess that's what, that was it. Right. You know, no, there's drive, one more drive my car. Um, the word what love, you doing right? and what, what you doing? doing. That's it. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that was fun. That is Some a fun of those, one to do. Yeah. The last two are a little. Of course, Drive My Car, we had that whole episode about the intro of it. Right. That's right, not right, right, right. to do either. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean about the Beatles? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, what else have we done? We've tried to do the end, which I think, you know, oh. like our shows, because they're rolling. But that final harmony is the, the guitar jam fun. But that final harmony has got to be so freaking perfect, you know that. So, <laughs> or you need to do something completely different with it, as but, with all this stuff, right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 I know. What, what has been your favorite Beatles thing to do? Man, uh, you know it depends on the night. We used to. We had a day in the life was was one of the Beatles songs that we put into the Flink set list, and we were all surprised that it worked. But it did work, and we would often save it and and make it the encore. And where it worked the best as an encore, which really like it should never have happened. But, you know, we'd play these like, you know, whatever, like biker bar, not maybe not biker bars. One of them was, but, you know, the, like a just a working class kind of bar. Right. You know, and and we'd play our our tunes throughout the night and everything would be great. And it would usually get pretty crazy and a little bit rowdy, but nothing terrible. And after just a night of sweaty mayhem. We would play Day Tripper. Uh, sorry, now I have Day Tripper on my mind because I'm thinking about that. We'd play A Day in the Life. And the best part about it was, you know, there'd be the four guys that had been sitting at the bar over there all night, completely ignoring the band. Like, whatever was happening, even if the dance floor was packed, like, those guys were not there for the music. And by golly, they weren't even going to take a minute to look over at what we were doing. And we would start A Day in the Life and one by one, all the heads would turn. And by the end of the song, everybody would be sitting down. You know, it's not a song that people would dance to or anything like that. So they would all be looking and we'd get a huge round of applause for it. Um, but so that was always a fun one to play. Yeah. Uh, but I, but not necessarily my favorite Beatles song to play. It was fun because of the effect that it delivered. But, you know, tell me why 
is one of those Beatles tunes that not not everybody knows they know, but everybody's probably most people have probably heard it. Uh, yeah. You know, tell me why you cried and why Love you it. lied, right? You know, and it's two and a half minutes of intense focus to keep that train on the tracks. Cause it's, it moves along at a fast clip. There's hardly any breaks and there's like weird, but fast turnarounds in it. And the harmonies need to be just locked in. And like, once that song starts, you know, but you know, it's like, uh Oh, we're in it. And you just stay on the tracks until it's over. And so that song was always fun to play. And, and I like that tune. Um, I, we used to do nowhere man. And that was always a nice sort of, you know, middle of the set breather kind of song. These are not, these are not easy songs. I mean, no, these are, you that's, know. that's what I'm saying. Fling, Fling is really good at playing the Beatles. It, it just, we are, we just turned out that we have the right mix uh, to, you know, to get the harmonies right and to, to play the grooves the right way and, and just enjoy putting out a version of these songs that people appreciate, you know? And so, yeah, no, they're not easy. That two and a half minutes of, of tell me why, uh, probably took us, you know, just as long, if not longer than any other song we added to the set list. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, yeah. Hard and, day's night seems to work. Uh, like when I play with my friend Mel, you know, this is kind of a pickup band and, yeah. you know, di different levels of, of, uh, musicianship. Um, hard day's night. You can kind of do can't buy me. Love is really hard. That's super hard, dude. That's super, super hard. hard. Yep. Yep. She loves you is another song that, until you try to learn it or, or just spend the time to dissect it, it seems super easy. And then you're like, Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is not for us. That's right. Yeah. No, he, I used to, I had a, a friend when I played in the responders back in Connecticut, uh, one of the, well, all of us in the band were Beatles fans, but one guy was a super Beatles fan, my friend, Keith Marin. And, uh, and he would go see, uh, these Beatles tribute bands, whenever they would come around, we actually wound up opening for a couple of them and stuff. Uh, obviously we didn't play Beatles songs those nights because you know, it didn't make sense. <laughs> well, you know uh, just, you know, give people a little mix, but, um, but he knew all of these Beatles tribute bands and knew like the inside baseball of them. He was, you know, he wasn't old enough to have, ex have experienced the Beatles when they were in their heyday, at least not, you know, when it would have mattered for him. But he was like Beatlemania was a, was the thing that he really got into. And a lot of the Beatles tribute bands that exist have people who, you know, were either in or involved in that whole Beatlemania thing. And so he knew all the inside baseball of every one of them. And, and he's like, oh, yeah, we got to go see this band because they play She Loves You. He's like, most of them will stay away from that tune. And he had like all these different things. But, you know, the thing was, he was right about how difficult these tunes were to play. And so it was, a, it was fun to go, you know, for a couple of years, I would go with them, you know, once, whatever, two, three times a year, maybe. And we'd go, you know, see Beatles tribute bands here and there. And, and it was, it was fascinating, not only just to see them, but to sort of experience them with, with him there dissecting everything and like, Oh yeah, man, you got to check this out. Look what this guy does here. Look how this band does this one differently than that one and how they yeah, choose yeah. to, you know, they're doing the, the shooby doo wops in the middle of uh revolution. Well, that the Beatles did that on the alternate takes and they did it live, but they never <laughs> did it here, but I think it adds something, you know, like that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think the reason the Beatles stuff works so well in for solo acoustic or small combo things is the melodies are so good. So you can strip down quite a bit of the instrumentation if you sing it well and people will really respond to it. Or if you, you know, get the melodies incorporated into, you know, acoustic, uh, instrumental performances, sure. that's that, but I, I, I come to the conclusion that it's just because the melodies are so yes. etched in people's, you know, minds and it, it, well a you. they're etched and b they're etched because they're really good and they're really good and and yeah i you know you're right if you're gonna reinterpret a beatles song think for a long time whether or not you're a better melody writer than <laughs> lennon mccartney or harrison or all three of them because you might decide that it's best not to change the melody that that's already been written. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they we don't, did, you know, in, you see in the McCartney, All Star band, we did a couple, right? Yeah, we did. We did. Can't do that, which is a really fun one to do. That's a good one. Simple. Yep. We, we did and butchered, uh, back in the USSR. 
We yeah. butchered the Which form actually, of that. that one. You should be able to, that one. And, yeah. and, um, that's right. You should not have butchered yeah. that one. That's right. <laughs> but the one that you and Breen sang the, those weird harmonies on, that was actually quite good. Hard, hard guitar solo. Oh, uh, are you talking about, uh, close your eyes, the all my loving or whatever yeah. it is? Yeah. 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 You're right. Yeah. 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 That one. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, that that's a fun that's one. It's really do. hard to play. I mean, you're playing that that guitar rhythm. You know, is that is diddle, that diddle, you know, diddle, 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 diddle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk about discipline, right? You yes. Say, and you can't you can't get fussy with it. You can't get sloppy with it either. Nope, nope. And we would play "Come Together" too, which which has that hit. one. That one is bar band legendary status, right? That one you can kind of you can kind of go pretty heavy with and not screw it up, right? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's you a, can. I mean, like Aerosmith, movie. Aerosmith sort of paved that way for us all, right? When they did true, their version true. of it. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. I I like the way the Beatles did it because it's heavy without being heavy, right? Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like it's it's heavy. Well, it's but, not big distorted guitars. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is how Nirvana got to where they had their distorted guitars, right? The story goes that Kurt Cobain, huge, obviously a huge Beatles fan. He's like, we got to distort the guitars. Otherwise people are just going to think we're the Beatles. You've got, we got all the same chords and all the same harmonies. So we got to, you know, we got to change something up. And so that I've was, never heard that story. Yeah. That was in, that was one of the, one of the Dave Grohl movies. I forget which one where he was talking about Nirvana. And he's like, yeah, he's like that. We were huge Beatles fans. So that's why we had to make things super heavy and distort the guitars. Otherwise uh, we just rip off the Beatles. It's like, Oh, that's interesting. Interesting, you know, way to go about it. Yeah. But yeah, come together. I like that. I, the, um, that the revelation about come together in Beatles or in McCartney three two one the thing on Hulu that happened that was released this past awesome. year. Well, it was it was it was going to be a Chuck Berry tune, right? It was like you know we come on right. flat top, he come grooving up slowly, he got, you know, and it was like yeah. oh you can't you can't rip off Chuck Berry, so let's, <laughs> let's slow it down, man. <laughs> Love it. Yep, I know. Yeah, it's great. I don't know how we got on here, or why we got on here, but it was fun. Well, we're talking about a, discipline. Taking and a detour of the more Beatles. There's discipline than trying to do Beatles stuff, right? It's a, there's nothing more discipline than an unplanned tangent talking about Beatles songs. <laughs> That's it. Hey, have you seen the um, Velvet Underground uh, doc on Apple TV? Not yet. I, you know, I have to be honest. Um, I very much respect what the Velvet Underground did. I they deserve all the praise that they have gotten. Uh, I am of the opinion that Lou Reed never should have sang any of his songs. Mm. Uh, I, but I feel the same way about Bob Dylan and and Neil Young too. So I understand that I am wrong and perhaps even objectively wrong. But it's well, many people feel. share your opinion. My wife shares your opinion. And my response to you and to her has always been, there's something about the guy who writes a story interpreting his own story. I mean, there's some, there's something to feel the coming out of that. So oh, I, I get you know, that. I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have him sing at my wedding. Right. <laughs> but, but, um, I, I enjoy, <laughs> yeah. I enjoy Dylan singing Dylan and I enjoy Lou Reed singing Lou Reed. That's good. Good for you. Yeah. I, I do not, I do not care for either of those <laughs> things to happen. Uh, but I'm fine listening to even Mick Jagger, who also is not really a great singer. Let's be perfectly fair about this. Uh, I'm I'm happy to hear Mick Jagger sing like a Rolling Stone. Like I love the Stones version of that tune. And Me you know, too. and and it's a it's a fantastic song. It's a great song. You can interpret it in lots of different ways and it just works. And so yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's great. But uh I'd much rather hear Hendrix sing Watchtower than than uh, uh than Dylan. So I was shocked when I found out that was a, that is a Dylan song, right? I, I have that is. right. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know. It's not my thing. So, so I have not, I have no allure that, 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 that documentary provides no allure for me, but I know I want to watch it because you know how much I love rock trivia yeah. and, and it's just going to be full of that stuff for me. Cause it's, I mean, that stuff's at the core of, you know, it's, it's one of the pillars of, of, of rock and roll, the Velvet Underground. So, yep. Yep. Did you ever go to CBGB's speaking of, you know, all those bands back then? I never did. Yeah. I, I actually, I, you know, I kind of, I left New York in the early seventies, 74. So that stuff was getting started right. about that time, but I was young and, um, and on, you know, subsequent trips back, like, you know, I'll walk through the village and kind of be aware, you know, there's some of the names of places that, that I know, but yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, by and large, I kind of missed that scene by, by always, who was, it was talking yesterday. There was something, 
Billy Joel was quoted about talking about how electric and magical New York in the 70s was, even though, you know, it was dirty and there was crime and Son of Sam and, you know, like, but just the general Times vibe. Square was not what you think it is. No, 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 no. <laughs> nothing like that. Yeah, not yeah. safe, no. not safe nor clean nor, you know, nor the... the it was not um, a place to visit unless you wanted a certain thing. <laughs> yeah, the, the retail uh, experience was a little different. It was different. But, the, pro- but, the product but, was different, that's all. Paul. Yeah, yeah the but Billy Joel came out with it, and, I, and it was echoed by a bunch of people. And yeah. I, I, sh- I try and find that, you know, whatever that article was, but it was just more like it was such an electric place that it was it was part of the vibe of why it was such a cultural mm. explosion in you know in urban New York City in the mid to late seventies. Yeah, that makes sense. No, it, it it absolutely makes sense. Well, and it wasn't you know it wasn't super expensive to live there you could you could survive there as an artist of 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 you know of, of many types not just a musician but you know it was a place where artists could go and and live whereas and you know did. And, and did right and created great things yeah my my friend alan who who makes he makes these cases called handle h a n d l uh, for iPhones and uh, it's actually kind of a cool design. They've got like this little handle on the bottom. I don't know how it's working with MagSafe anymore, but um, he is an artist and uh, does sculpting and things like that. And he bought this building down in, in, uh, in Soho, you know, back when it was just like a laundromat in there or whatever. And he just needed a place to, to work and have his art. And so he, you know, tried to rent it out or whatever. Of course, <laughs> You know, he's kept that building. So now you can guess what his greatest asset as an artist is. And it is his building, <laughs> which which will, I'm sure, provide for his grandkids uh, as well. But, you know, like things, the, the fact that someone who was an artist could buy a building seems pre- in New York City seems preposterous today. And yet that that's exactly what he did because it was that made sense. He's like, well, I needed a place to go. And so, you know, we figured it out and we made it happen. And here we are. And now it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing. And it just happened around him. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Speaking of, speaking of, of, of artists and albums with history, I am playing this week and rehearsing and then playing on Thursday night with my friend Stu, he's doing this. I think I mentioned it on the show briefly, but he's doing this uh, once a month. He's doing a tribute to an album at this club here in Portsmouth called the press room. And this month I am playing with him and we are doing uh, Marvin Gaye's what's going on. And that's all we're doing is that album. We'll stretch things out a little bit, but I don't think we'll have an hour's worth of music. I mean, I think that record's 38 minutes long or something like that. And it's cool that the press room's, sort of allowing this to happen and they're happily booking it and people, you know, are buying tickets and all that stuff. And the best part about it for me is he's got somebody else playing drums. So what are you gonna play? I get to play percussion, which ah. on, on this record is to me like I'm that it is would definitely be my first choice on this. And it was not my first choice. He's just like, can you do it? And I'm like, sure. You know, I put it on my calendar and we booked, booked the rehearsals. I'm like, Hey man, um, am I playing drum set on this? He's like, no, 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 no. John's playing that. I'm like, okay, cool. Great. <laughs> but cause it's such a, it's like that whole record. It's a weird record. Y- you know, you hear the hits and, but if you, if you sit and listen to the whole record, it's, it's got some weird moments. They're sort of peppered throughout it. And it almost just flows. Not almost. Most of it does just flow from, you know, one it's, it's a, it's essentially a, a letter or, or songs written around the letters that he wrote to his brother to tell him what's going on. And, um, and it's, so it's, it's, but it's all just groove, like just like heavy grooves. And so to be able to play, I think I'll mostly be playing congas on this, but. Is it the, the funk brothers that were the back? Of yeah, this? it's the funk brothers. Yeah. So we're doing it a little differently. We don't have, uh, you know, we, we don't have 30 musicians on stage. So uh, we're doing, moving a lot of the, orchestration stuff to the keys. So we will have uh, one guy is playing a, an organ. He's got a B3 and a Leslie, which is, it's been a while since I've been on stage with a Leslie. I, man, I, I forgot what that was like. It's so that sound is, there's nothing like it, man. The, you know, you can, you can get close to making things sound like it with some, you know, synthesizers and things like that, but mm-hmm. there's nothing quite like, that Leslie moving the air that way with that sound from the B3, it's, it's its own thing. 
And I was really Agreed. stoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, we have another rehearsal tomorrow night and then, um, and then the gig is, is Thursday. And I think we have two other gigs, two other performances of this coming up as well. So, and I, I now have I have to, to learn all the harmonies too, because things changed with the lineup of the band, but that's fine. You know me, I like, you know. It's like a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I have to say that I think for music scenes, those, you know, special album nights or, you know, artist tribute nights or, you know, evenings where where a band plays a whole album side, you know, like sure. what Fish does and, yeah. you know, Warren Haynes does it. I think those are really cool things and fun for local music fans. They really, yep. you know, you can dive into something in a different way and, and uh, you know, express love for a certain type of music or a certain artist in a certain way. I think those are great, great, great things. I agree. I, 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 you're, I, I, yeah, I think I, you know, I'm definitely seeing a a growth in the tribute band, you know, vibe too, and popularity too. We just went and saw a band called foreigners journey, which is, um, you know, as you might guess, (laughs) they play the music of foreigner and journey. My friend, Kevin, uh, who I played a couple of gigs with a couple of years ago uh, is their guitar player. And he really is just perfect for this band. Like he has the right look, but, but way more than that, he can play all that stuff and just owns it and performs it. That's and cool. their singer left about a year ago. And I'm not sure who started the band or anything. I don't know the backstory, but I know that their singer left and he was fantastic. And they've now got Constantine Marula singing with them. And we went and Constantine was uh, on American Idol uh, number of years back. And then he went and he did, uh, he did, he was the lead in uh, rock of ages on Broadway for a little bit too. And we actually got to see him on Broadway, but he, uh, he sings in this band and he does a great job. He's a, you know, he's a born performer and, and sure. can hit most of those notes. Uh, some of those Lou Graham notes are like singing Sammy Hagar notes. Those are super high, man. Super uh, high. But uh, he kills all the journey stuff and he does a great job with the foreigner stuff. So it's, um, it was, it was a fun little night to see, but it's, it's interesting. We have these weird clubs. I've told you about them before. They're like dinner theaters. It's really what it is. It's a dinner theater, but they have mm-hmm. rock bands or tribute acts is the, the most common thing that comes through. This was Tupelo music hall out in Derry, New Hampshire, where we saw this, but we've got the other one near us. I've mentioned a couple of times, blue ocean. And then there's this place aura in Maine. It's that's less of a dinner theater. That's more just a rock club, but yeah, it's this weird thing where you go and you sit at tables and watch a band play. It's a weird vibe. Man. Yeah. Yeah. There's one of those around here and a couple of bands that I know have done, have you know, done some shows there, Yeah. but you know, it's a different thing. You don't do a cover band show at something like that in mm-hmm. general. You, you know, you don't do a dance show at a, at a dinner, at a, at a venue like that. No. Yeah. So it's a and different it was thing. weird. I, it was weird seeing, I, I've seen this Rush tribute band, Lotus Land, at a couple of these places. And and for me, it, that works fine to sit at a table and, and watch the band perform this material, right? It's great. It was a little weird with Foreigner's Journey where it was like, really, everybody should just be packed up against the stage for yeah, this kind for like, of at, music. For a rock and roll show. Yeah, yeah, this is a rock and roll show. It's supposed to be sweaty. It's supposed to be a little bump and grindy. You, you know, like, I mean, it's that music, right? So it was sort of weird experiencing it seated at, you know, tables or, or whatever. And um, how hard for the for the performers to generate the, the energy that they need to generate in a setting like that, right? Yeah, and it was a little weird because Constantine kept coming out and like walking through the crowd which was fine, uh, except a. I think he did a little too much if, if, for my taste, and and because he probably spent thirty percent of the show off of the stage, which was too much, huh. especially in this place because they did not have a spotlight, right? So when he came off the stage, the first thing they do is turn up the you know the the audience blinder lights, right? So that you know, so there was some sort of white light out in the crowd, and then as he got further from the stage, they would just turn up. They would you know bring the dimmer up on the house lights, and that's when you realized guys, we're still in a dinner theater here. Like this place is kind of a, you know, grungy warehouse that's been made to look good when the lights are down, (laughs) you know? Uh And so it was just a little bit awkward. Like, yeah, you probably should get back to the stage so that they can turn the lights back off out here and and we can, we can keep looking at stage lights, man. (laughs) So yeah, it's just a weird thing. I'd, I'd like to go see them again in a, you know, in a different setting just to see what that's like, because my guess is it's more like the rock show you would expect it to be. So yeah. but they were good. They were really good. Yeah. You know, I, I've been reflecting a lot on that, on that, what you said uh, about how 
the cover band scene where uh, in the Bay Area where you've come to see me and visit me yeah. is so different from other places. I think we need to drill down on that and just kind of because you know I kind of operate that that all scenes have elements of of the same. Like all our listeners have elements of the same challenges that they're facing. But I really want to you know. But you're saying that you have dinner clubs there, which is you know I have <laughs> one, but you have a couple, yeah. and and you know. But we are saying out. that these tribute shows, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So maybe the way we approach that conversation is, you know, a scene is a serendipitous um, collection of yeah. what are the really good performers really good at? What are the existing venues and how are they set up and ready to, you know, yeah. to, to present music, right? It's a, it's a lot what of accidents. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, a lot yeah. Of it's a lot of accidents. I mean, it's, you know, it's that it's it, that old Steve Jobs quote sort of applies, right? You know, it, you can easily draw the line as long as you're looking backwards, but definitely not forward. And I think that the genesis of a music scene is exactly that. Like all of these events sort of ca randomly, chaotically happen, crashing into each other and the things that work, work. And then you forget about the rest of the things that didn't work in that particular scene, right? And that, that's okay. Like that's yeah. just how it how it be. Yeah. So I don't know. That's what I got. This is a good little jam session today, man. Yeah, we we just we, we went all over the place. I know it was free form. It, it was, was not disciplined. No, it was <laughs> it was a it was a little jam session. We 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 owed this to ourselves. This was fun. There you go. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's funny for an episode that should have been about focus and discipline. Uh, was was exactly the opposite of that. And I loved it. But this is this is what I love. You know, when I, I talked in the past, here we are not finishing. Um, when I would build, I would spend hours on like a Friday building the fling set list for the, you know, that gig that night or the Saturday night or whatever. And I really would. I would pour through all our songs. I would start from scratch with each one. I just have our song list, which I had categorized by sort of type of song or effect that the song would have in the set. So I could sort of start to build things. And, uh, and then if we were feeling it, I would throw the set list, not, not literally throw it away. I'd always have it there, but, but figuratively we'd throw the set list away the moment we took the stage and, and just audible our way through it. But the nice part about that is the set list was always there. So if inspiration didn't strike, well, I'll tell you what the next song is. Right. And the same things here today, we had a, we had an agenda and we actually, we wound up getting through most of it and then some, but not in the order we had planned, That's right. <laughs> which is great. Yeah, it's good. We got there. We got there. I think we Let's got there. took the scenic route. You know, man, the scenic route isn't such a bad thing. I no, kind of Stop like and it. smell the roses. That's it, man. Stop and smell the roses. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's what I got. You got anything else? We're good, bro. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. Make sure to check out Ultimate Ears Pro. Pro.ultimateears.com. GigGab20 is your coupon code. That's G-I-G-G-A-B-2-0. Good through the end of October to save 20% on lots of their stuff. Oh. Stick your nose in ears and always be performing. I love it.